We're here today with uh, Matt Briette, the uh, President and CEO of the Commonwealth Foundation for Public Policy Alternatives, com more commonly known as the Commonwealth Foundation. Uh, Matt, the, the, the big thing that's going on right now is we have a governor who is a conservative. Uh, it should, it's a long-time wish of yours to get somebody into office who, who is an avowed budget cutter. He hasn't had a chance to start doing it yet. Um, how do you think this is going to work out? Well, it's clearly going to be a 180 shift in terms of a lot of the rhetoric that uh, we've heard coming out of the governor's office with regard to what government needs to be doing. And uh, Tom Corbett has said, of course, that we need to be cutting our spending, that that has been the problem. Uh, we've been on an unsustainable path of increased spending that has far exceeded our ability to pay. And I think that uh, we're certainly seeing that with the loss of federal stimulus money. One-time expenditures is creating a significant budget shortfall, uh, meaning the amount of money that the state's taking in and what we've been spending, uh, there's a wide gap. Some say upwards of $5 billion. Uh, certainly Tom Corbett has said he's not going to raise taxes in order to bridge that gap, uh, but it's going to require reductions in state spending. And uh, we've long been uh, touting that there are lots of areas that we could be cutting in state spending, areas that are not core functions of government, areas that uh, would not harm uh, folks that need that government safety net for health care or, or uh, you name it. Uh, but there are a lot of areas that uh, we simply shouldn't be spending yeah, money on. The Commonwealth Foundation, sort of like the Subway franchise, has the five dollar foot long. You have five ways to <laughs> save five billion. That's what, right. What, what five ways do we have? Yeah, five ways to five billion is a publication we put out. Uh, in fact, we identified over eight billion dollars uh, that could be saved. Um, right now, Pennsylvania is the number two spender on corporate welfare, meaning we have been spending a bi about a billion dollars every year. Uh, in the form of grants and subsidies uh, to try to lure corporations to come to Pennsylvania or even relocate within Pennsylvania. Uh, we've been number two to Ohio uh, for many years and sometimes number one in what we consider to be corporate welfare. Hasn't worked out very well for us. Our uh, job growth numbers are abysmal. Our income growth, population growth, all these things that should be on the uptick because of all the spending are not there. So Do we're you talking think about you have the support though, of the business community to cut corporate welfare. Well, um, we uh, that that doesn't determine whether or not we believe that that is a good or a bad policy idea. I think experience has demonstrated it isn't. Certainly, you will have the rent seekers, those who benefit from taxpayer subsidies that will continue to come to Harrisburg with their hat out. Uh, but we think that that is a well, failed strategy. Isn't that one of the problems though that when you start cutting uh, entitlement, let's say we cut nurse. Sure. Cuts, uh, Medicaid, which cuts money for nursing homes, which then upsets the nursing homes. I mean, yeah. how, how do you how do you pull this off? Well, and that that is the challenge, of course, because you've got those that say, yes, we need to reduce our spending, but don't touch my spending, uh, and that's why we tend to always see government grow. Uh, but I think if Tom Corbett is to keep his promise over the next four years and not raise taxes, he has no other choice, and that's going to require folks sitting down and saying. What are the priorities of state government? What should state government be doing? List them in order of priority, and then see how much money we've got to spend. And then when you're out, then I cut you off now. Yeah. Can you name a couple of these? We have corporate welfare. So that's yeah, that's about a billion that's dollars. A billion. Okay, yes. so we got four million. To go. We've identified opportunities uh, in long-term health care that we aren't reducing the safety net, but uh, we're actually uh, changing the way in which we deliver this so that we have identified about a billion dollars in that. Uh, we've identified uh, hundreds of millions of dollars in transportation that can be saved by eliminating uh, prevailing wage or redefining it really to the market wage, the occupation wage, rather than inflated wage prices. Uh, we've identified in all sorts of other areas that, uh, well, Auditor General Jack Wagner has identified in public welfare upwards of a billion dollars. So uh, at, at the end of the day, clearly there's enough that could be cut without harming those who need uh, uh, assistance the most. The, one of the hot topics right now is selling the state's liquor store monopoly. Uh, mm -hmm. Hearings have begun. Uh, the Commonwealth Foundation is often quoted as the source of a $2 billion estimate of the value of the state liquor store monopoly. What, what is your current view of what it's worth? 
Well, uh, Governor Rendell said that they thought it was about a $1.5 billion. At the end of the day, Tony, the only way we'll know is when we go to auction. And it does depend on how many licenses uh, we're going to auction off. Uh, Representative Terzai's bill, the only one that had been introduced in the past last year, uh, we're still waiting to see what that looks like uh, here in t uh, 2011, would increase the number of stores from current about 620 to 750, plus another 100 uh, wholesale uh, or distribution licenses. Um, that would, uh, we have, we think, could generate upwards of $2 billion. But again, you have to figure out exactly uh, um, what the marketplace is going to, to purchase those for because you are buying monopoly licenses. Is 750 the right amount of stores? Um, I would probably say no uh, because you look across the border into New Jersey where they have only two-thirds the number of residents. Uh, their land mass is, I don't know, maybe a fourth <laughs> of what Pennsylvania. Uh, they have 1,800 stores. In fact, if you were to look at Pennsylvania and said, what's the national average uh, in terms of liquor store licenses per 1,000 residents, we should have actually about 3,000 uh, liquor store establishments that uh, would be able to meet consumer needs. So I think when you're talking about selling a monopoly mm -hmm. license, which we are, if there's only 750, mm -hmm. the value of that license goes up significantly relative to what you'd pay for it in New Jersey or in Maryland or other states. It, it looks so, even John Pippi, the, the senator who chairs the, the committee, the Law and Justice Committee in the Senate, who's opened the first hearings, he expressed some doubt that the liquor stores could be divested in, in a year's time, that it can't be part of this year's budget settlement. Do you think that's a reasonable concern? I, I think so. I think that that's accurate, that this, uh, if we do it right, it's going to take some time. It can't be done. I believe, in time for the uh, June 30th deadline for the next budget. So um, I don't see this as a real uh, filler of the budget going forward. That said, uh, we also would not support using, even if we get $2 billion or more, or whatever that number is, to fill the current budget. In fact, we would argue that that money, as uh, Representative Terzai had argued, that money ought to be put into a fund to help offset our pension liabilities. Because we know we're going to have to pay those billions of dollars off, and we ought to use this to help mitigate increases in local property taxes because schools are going to have to pay for these pensions. So, for example, if we got $2 billion, let's put that into a fund that uh, you could met out, say, $200 million every year for the next 10 years in order to help offset property tax increases for pension costs. So there are some unique ways that you could use the one-time infusion of cash from the sale of this asset uh, to help mitigate other tax increases on Pennsylvanians. Help me out, Commonwealth Foundation's not ashamed to be conservative. Would you call the organization libertarian? Mm -hmm. I would call us free market free because, market. yeah, libertarian or conservative certainly connote uh, positions on social issues. Yeah. Uh, we don't take positions there. We take positions strictly on issues of economics. And so we're going to certainly attract free market conservatives, free market libertarians, people who believe that uh, markets work better I'll than I'll tell you why control. I raised the question, yeah. because you know, from a consumer viewpoint, if you ask the man on the street, uh, Joe Sixpack, you know, how many liquor stores, how many uh, beer outlets should we have, he would say, let's have one on every corner. I want convenience. I want to right. buy my beer or booze when I want it. Uh, which would mean more than 3,000 sure. licenses. Is that something that you could support, or is that go oh, against certainly. the financial? No, I, I certainly think, it, you know, the purpose here uh, shouldn't necessarily to be to generate more revenue for the government. Mm -hmm. Because if that were the case, then we ought to be talking about, well, why don't we governmentize all of our Walmart stores or our grocery stores, because those could be revenue generators for the state. The purpose in this is saying, hey, government really has no business in the sale of alcohol. Government's role should be in the regulatory side, just like 48 other states do. Most states are not in the business like we are in Pennsylvania. And so the idea is let, let's allow the marketplace to determine where stores ought to be uh, uh, placed, um, who ought to be able to purchase these liquor licenses, and really that allowing for that marketplace like we do in everything else, holding them accountable, having the same law enforcement uh, agencies and people checking them as they do today for taverns and restaurants. Uh, but this is saying, this is not a core function of government. Let's get it out of this business. In other states where they're attempting to privatize liquor sales, like Virginia, 
um, the governor's been trying to privatize the state stores there for 14, 18 months now, and it's getting bogged down in the details. Uh, labor unions that work in the stores is just one issue. There's also people of conservative Christian viewpoints that don't believe that we ought to be selling liquor anywhere. Right. So, I mean, is that going to happen in Pennsylvania, do you think? <laughs> well, prohibition didn't work, uh, and that's obvious that uh, why we moved away from that idea. So the challenge is, is how do we manage this, recognizing that alcohol is a drug, it has real dangers associated with it. So the challenge is to say, all right, we're going to have government to be the law enforcement, not pushing alcohol like we are today with the LCB, but have oversight and regulation and uh, making sure that we aren't selling to underage drinkers or that we're managing problems that are certainly associated with alcohol. Um, those challenges will always be there. The question is, should government be in the business of selling booze as well as trying to regulate it? Let's go back to the budget. One of the things that's puzzled me is you're an advocate of school vouchers, mm -hmm. spending state money to give vouchers to parents to let their kids go to whatever schools they want to go to, private or public. Uh, isn't that a budget buster for the future, though? Uh, a, a, a new entitlement yeah. program to, 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 very frankly, support parochial schools. I'm not saying for or against yeah. that, but, but it's, that's going to cost hundreds of millions of dollars, isn't it? Well, actually, it's not. It will save the taxpayers money. Because let's take the example of the Harrisburg City School District. Right now, the taxpayers are paying nearly $18,000 for every child uh, going to the Harrisburg City Schools. Um, yet many of these children are not getting the education that they've been promised. What the voucher under a Senate Bill 1 would do, it would say, let's just take $8,800, the share that the state is contributing to the school district, and allow parents to make choices uh, with that money, which would then leave behind about $8,900 into the school district for a child they no longer have to educate. So we're saying, use the $26 billion we already spend in public education and give children about half of that amount, low-income families, to make a choice for a better or a safer school. So in fact, what it does is increases the per-pupil spending in the school district where the children are staying put, or it allows for the taxpayers to see tax relief by putting that money back into the taxpayers' hands. So this doesn't, and it should not be, an increase in spending, but it actually is a reduction by saying, we can give these kids a better education at a fraction of the cost. Recognizing that even in the private sector, companies like General Motors, uh, Chrysler have failed. I mean, huge corporations run by the brightest minds using private enterprise just can't cut it. And then we'll, let's apply that to failures of the public sector, like in education. Do you think that your viewpoint is realistic, that we can have this best of both worlds, we can cut funding uh, to public schools in the aggregate and still get a better result? Well, the question is, is are we going to fund systems in schools or children's education? Under a voucher plan, it's saying we're going to fund children's education, and it doesn't matter whether it's a public school, charter school, private school, religious school, that we're going to fund their education where they can find the best education possible. Monopolies don't work, whether it's in business or in the public sector. And that's what we're talking about right now is a system with high cost, low quality, and by giving parents choices to escape and forcing those schools to start to compete, uh, that's how we're going to get the quality of education that our kids deserve and that our taxpayers are paying for. I think the analogy to uh, the big three, really their problem has been a, a monopoly in a sense. They've been challenged. And they should have gone out of business in many ways instead of the taxpayers pumping millions and billions of dollars into them to rescue them. The reason that they are now beginning to uh, come out is because of the competition that they face. And that's why maybe we're going to start getting better Chevrolets and Dodges and everything else because of the competition, not because they were retained as a monopoly. Well, let's stipulate you are getting better <laughs> Chevrolets and, and, and Dodges and Jeeps. And we'll just we don't want to offend anybody. Uh, <laughs> well, as a Dodge driver, I hope we are. <laughs> the, the, the problem with what you're saying that worries me, and, and I just because I can't figure out, if you have this revolution in education, you know, what happens to the kids? Let's say the revolution does take place, but there are 
hundreds of thousands of kids who don't get good service for six, eight, ten years while this changeover is going through. I mean, how can you pull well, this off? See, we had this discussion back in 1996 when Governor Tom Rich said uh, the very same thing. We have underperforming schools. Let's give kids vouchers to escape those schools. Fifteen years later, after a generation of children have been lost in a lot of schools that are just utterly failing, uh, that's the problem, is that we have already lost a generation of kids, and it's time to give them what I'm calling an educational lifeline. Give them the opportunity to escape those schools that are not doing well and force them to improve or shut them down. Problem has been is that they've just gotten more and more money and they haven't had to improve because they don't face the kind of competition that so, is so necessary. So from your viewpoint, the libertarian viewpoint, where people point to charter schools that don't do a good job or have failed, as we've seen a couple fail right mm -hmm. here that's in right. Harrisburg, that's a good thing because Absolutely. it's survival of the fittest. Well, that, that is called creative destruction, as economists call it, and we want to have that in the marketplace. We want businesses that are not serving consumers to go out of business. We see it happen with restaurants all of the time. It ought to be happening with schools that are failing to serve kids. They should go out of business and not get more money. Mm -hmm. One other area, state government, uh, that uh, is a problem that's not very widely recognized is this situation with our transportation system, our highways mm -hmm. and bridges particularly. Is that an area where your organization could, could support the idea of additional funding, which you could call it a tax, you could call it a user fee, whatever mm -hmm. you want to do? Is that, is that something you're Well, doing? additional funding ought to be the last thing on our list uh, after we look at all of the opportunities to, to make sure that our transportation tax dollars are going as far as they can. For example, we ought to be looking at prevailing wage requirements on public projects. We know that uh, prevailing wage adds 30, 40 percent additional labor costs to any public construction project, whether we're talking about schools or roads, highways, and bridges. This would be a real opportunity for us to make sure that every transportation tax dollar goes as far as it can before we start saying we need higher taxes. Now another part of this solution is certainly going to be how we fund these roads, highways, and bridges because we know that the gas taxes cars have gotten more efficient um, and people are driving more and in fact paying less as a result of it, we're going to have to figure out a new funding mechanism for our roads, highways, and bridges. And uh, we are proponents of tolling, uh, user fees, that this needs to be part of our future plans for uh, generating revenue. Now, we were very much opposed to the tolling of I-80 because it wasn't just a toll on that interstate, it was in fact a tax on the drivers to help subsidize other areas of mass transportation, particularly SEPTA and PATH, the mass transit systems in, in Philadelphia and Pittsburgh. Now, if we're talking about a user fee that goes directly into the road that is being utilized and we're talking about a comprehensive plan that looks at all of our interstates as uh, potential tolling uh, means of, of paying for those roads, that's a scheme that we would definitely support. And it's pretty clear, though, that the federal government isn't going to help the states for the next couple of years on highways and bridges, so you're not going to call uh, Governor Corbett a failure if he comes out with a, an in-state highway solution, are you? Oh, no, he's going to have to come up with that uh, in-state because, of course, we've got uh, real challenges in Pennsylvania that we recognize. Uh, that we will agree that there needs to be something done. Uh, but the first step is not simply raising gas taxes or other taxes, but it's saying let's maximize the transportation tax dollars and fees that we already collect, and then we can say how much more do we need and looking at uh, alternatives that way. Well, unfortunately, we're not going the route of let's reform our current system and then talk about revenues. A lot of the discussion has been about Let's just get more money, and then we'll figure out how to spend it later. Anything I've left out of the, your, your ideas about how to help save the state money or make the Commonwealth work better? No, I, I think uh, you know, great opportunities exist with uh, the, a new administration, with uh, new leadership in many of our uh, legislative caucuses. And uh, these are going to be difficult times, but I think they're also a great opportunity for Pennsylvania to become a more business-friendly state, improve our education system, get government out of businesses it ought not to be in, and uh, really improve our government and regain the trust 
uh, that has been lost for so many years with the general public. We've been talking to Matt Briette, President and CEO of the Commonwealth Foundation.